Hello, I'm Nancy Hungerford, moderator and former CNBC anchor, and I am delighted to be leading this conversation at such a pivotal time for AI and innovation and everything going on in this space. It's going to transform the customer experience as well. And I'm here with an esteemed panel. That is Alan Winters. Lovely to see you. Nice to be here. Also with us is Aton Greenspoon, who is a professor at the University of Toronto in mathematics and computer science. Happy to be here. And last but not least, of course, Joshua Friedman, who is the CEO of Six Seconds, the leading nonprofit encouraging emotional intelligence and the practice of. At this time, when we're focusing so much on computers and AI, we're keen to get your thoughts on the emotional component. And that's really what we're here to discuss. Yes, it's all about the machines, but we can't neglect the incredibly important emotional intelligence component. In fact, you might argue that it's more important than ever. I know that's a big part of TP's culture, Ellen. So I want to start with you. How can AI simulations make human agents more adept at resolving customer concerns and really building stronger brand loyalty? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And I'll give you a couple of examples of things that we're looking at. Clearly, they're not here today, but I think very, very soon. So in the customer service space, when you bring new frontline agents on, they go through an onboarding program and then anywhere from four to eight weeks of training. So you could harness the power of AI and incorporate that to have real life role plays of real life interactions that are highly emotionally in charge charge where you would need to have empathy and the EI skills, et cetera, that, that we're trained to really be successful. So you could harness that power before they even take a phone call and really show the type of, of um, interactions they'll be having and issues they need to solve all from an, uh, from an EI and empathetic perspective. Do the same thing in the onboarding program and even in the recruiting process where you could arm and get better intelligence about who you're hiring, when you're hiring, and what the right role is for that person based on their EI scores. That sounds very promising, but as you say, perhaps we're not there fully yet. And I wanna go to Aton on this with your knowledge of the AI models and simulations. Like, what are the challenges to getting there? That's a great question, Nancy. I ask myself that all the time. I think that the words that come to mind first are trust, privacy and yeah. fairness. There's other challenges beyond that, but let me give you an example of each of these. So in terms of trust, AI models today are essentially black boxes. Yeah. When they make decisions, when they lead to next steps, they don't explain um, how these arise. If I don't know the reasoning behind it, how can I trust that it's making a good decision? Yeah. What about privacy? It, one of the things we're looking for with AI models that connect to humans mm -hmm. is that they may recall previous interactions. They may recall that Josh called in very agitated last week, and that can help with personalization and customization. However, it could also be eerie if the AI model points out, Josh, I see that every Friday you call in irritated. So where is the... Where is the fine line between um, collecting information in order to personalize and better connect based on memory, but overstepping that line into an individual's privacy? And that's something that both experts who are programming the AIs and the AIs have to navigate. Um, fairness. So suppose, so AI models are trained on huge amounts of data. Yeah. Suppose you have an A model that you're uh, very happy with, that's performing very well in the English language. There may, may not be the same amount of uh, data available in another language to reach the same uh, level of training. Another example where fairness can, uh, can come in is in, uh, in multimodal AIs that are not just taking in text, but also voice and visuals. The way that you express emotions may, may be different than someone from a different cultural background. And if I train on uh, predominantly one uh, demographic, I may misread and ultimately treat unfairly uh, someone from a different demographic for that That's a good reason. Point. 
So I said, trust, privacy, and fairness. And I said, there's other types of challenges. I'll leave you with one example of another one. It's like this. If there are unnatural pauses, this can be problematic to connecting. It breaks the, the, the flow of communication. And so just simple technical challenges of reducing delays, reducing latency, mm -hmm. making the AIs operate in real time. And while that just sounds like, well, computers are just getting faster, it's not so simple. A lot of that has to do with offloading some of the AI technology from the cloud to what we call to the edge, the computer that's closest to where it's being deployed. And so there are some deep technical challenges associated with reducing latency. Hmm. Those are all brilliant examples. And I'm looking to Joshua now with your lens into emotional intelligence and how much of that do you agree with and perhaps to what extent can implementing more emotional elements to this solve the problem? So I think there's a related to the trust piece that Eitan talked about is the authenticity question. And I think right now we're seeing people creating emotional connections with AIs. Right. And there are people who have AI girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, bot friend. Shocking, but true. <laughs> um, and I mean, they're sad cases too of, you know, teenagers. Recently, there was a case of a teenager who committed suicide, uh, who seemed to be motivated by connecting more, you know, come to my world of the AI. Um, so clearly people are forming this emotional attachment. I think I do the same thing with books or a character in a movie, but I know they're fictional, right? And I think most of us know this isn't real. So I think there's an element about that kind of deeper than trust is a sense of like, is, is this a real or is this play? Is this a role play? Because I don't think when we're role playing, I don't think I prefer real play. Can we actually have a conversation and practice together? But that said, there are a number of challenges when it comes to learning emotional intelligence, um, noticing even your own facial expression. Yeah. Like something as simple as like, am I smiling right now? You know, and when, you know, hold on, I got this, you know, frown line in my forehead, what's going on? You said it's just a little bit of added awareness that I think you know, something as low tech as a mirror can help us notice certain things. I think AI can help us notice, hey, you're using this word a lot. Okay. Hey, your voice is stressed right now. Hey, did you notice this, this part of the communication? And so expanding our awareness, having a different perspective, I think something that AI can pretty quickly start to offer us in this kind of realm of training. Can I add yep, it? Yep, It's actually an interesting point. There's two two pieces, and both use the word trust, and trust is an emotion, and trust is a feeling. And mm -hmm. whether it's the customer's trust of the company or our client doing the right thing for, for them and building that, or the trust that our TP agents build rapport with, with our clients, all related to what, what Josh has said. So that's why I kind of chuckled. I remember when I was a frontline supervisor 30 years ago, we had mirrors on everybody's desk so people could look at their facial expressions because you can hear the smile through the phone was, was the tagline. Um, but you could use, and what we're doing with the quality coach process from an EI perspective is arming our quality coach to listen for exactly what Josh is talking about and watch the body language or the words and tones, et cetera, to coach from that perspective. But if you pull in AI to give you that data, that's powerful to arm our people with that understanding. Or it could be potentially uh, uh, years down the road where uh, our agents, or TP agents, can see their own facial expressions as they're doing interactions and correct wow. right away because they're they're seeing it all from the power of AI. The key is the human is still delivering the empathetic conversation and the activity to the customer. Are you already using AI-driven technologies to, I know you're not there yet with facial recognition for everyone, but in just smaller ways to tweak their interactions? Uh, like the email? Yeah, we, we are in terms of 
how we're integrating part of AI over time into our tops, our operating model process, what our frontline supervisors use and how they're managed their teams and, and our people. We're just not far enough along yet um, because the technology is still developing. And frankly, we're dealing with the privacy issues based on all the countries we operate in as well, because they're very different regulations based on what you can collect and how long you can have it for, et cetera. Um, we're, we're going through all of that analysis now to make sure that we're caring for that piece of the, the puzzle as well. And, and the fact that in different countries, again, cultural expressions may also exactly. be different. Absolutely, very, very. Sure too. At the same time, every time any one of us is writing an email these days or writing a text, we're getting, we're getting AI prompting us, right? And it's yeah. kind of influencing what we say ultimately. Yeah. And this, I'm really curious about this in terms of like, is it become a human driven process? Or are the AIs shaping already the other way around the way we express ourselves? There's definitely sort of flow in both directions, right? Yeah. And even even when we talk about um, the remarks you were making about um, recognizing emotions and and noticing, hey, you're a little bit stressed. What? Where is the line? Uh, have you you know you've had these interactions with a a partner or a friend that keeps telling you you're a bit stressed, right? You look a bit stressed. Yeah. The look of great stuff. Metaphors. Are you tired? You're being defensive, right? You're being defensive. So where's where is the fine line between the feedback and uh, the the slight push, or even to put it more darkly, the manip manipulation, right? So there's a there's a there's a careful uh, concern there that has to be managed. I wonder too when you talk about fairness from the angle of if I'm the person calling up. Like you said, let's say Joshua calls every Friday and you get flagged. What if you've had one bad call on a Friday and you get flagged as a frustrated customer? Call again and you're actually not. So the computer might be making an assumption, whereas then you need the human to pivot quickly and self-correct because all of a sudden you realize like, oh, like this person's quite pleasant today. I, I think we need to look at both sides of that, mm. the positive aspect. What if you call back and you got the exact same agent that you spoke to last time? who already understands what you were dealing right. with because AI allowed us to pair well, yeah, the two people true. together to solve the problem. So you can, you do absolutely from a data ethics perspective have to be thinking about how things should be used inappropriately, mm -hmm. but that's a small number compared to how really what the power of AI can allow our people to do or people to do much better if you use it correctly. It's a great example. We're, we're matching people with somebody with the right skill set. Yeah you know, based on the problem that you're having. Exactly. And the problem or the, or your, or your approach. Exactly. So some, so right. as, as, as Nancy and I discussed before, she's very goal oriented. She might not want, uh, an, an agent who expresses a lot of process oriented remarks, or she might want more reminders of like, I'm going to go through this process because I have your goal in mind. Yes. You want this refund and that's what I'm working on that's and to do. That. And so. As, as, as since different people have different communication styles, it can be also about matching up call, uh, people who are calling in customers mm -hmm. with agents who are well-versed or naturally adept to a certain communication style. I think this piece is just an overall basic need in customer experience is to very quickly understand, does this person want to be heard? Do they want help or do they want a hug? And you know, sometimes you might be very goal oriented, but sometimes you just want to be heard or sometimes you want the hug, you know? And, and I would just say, I think it's broader than customer experience. It's actually the human experience mm -hmm. right. because the way we're approaching it is we're holding our internal managers as accountable to deliver that same emotional connection and interactions with their people as we are our TP experts with our clients, customers. And you have to do both together for that reinforcement. Because if you're not living that and, and you're not seeing that from your boss, why would you then deliver that to someone else if you're not getting that in True. return?